Time is a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective, hosted by Tim Ullman and Jack Caliber. The ULC envisions a future in which all congregations fully equip the priesthood of all believers through world-class leadership development at the local level. Lead Time taps into biblical wisdom for practical solutions to today's burning issues. Each podcast confronts real-time struggles facing the local church in a post-Christian culture. Step into the action with the ULC at uniteleadership.org. This is Lead Time. Welcome to Lead Time. Tim Allman here. This is a special bonus edition of, of lead time. I've had a number of people reaching out to me um, concerned about everything that's taking place right now, Concordia University, Wisconsin, and the Concordia University Ann Arbor uh, situation. And I have, and I would say it's an opportunity for kingdom-minded collaborative growth moving forward. Um, This, just to put a timestamp on this conversation, this is being recorded on Tuesday, February 20th. Um, I and many others have listened to town halls uh, with uh, Dr. Ankerberg and his his team um, there at Concordia Ann Arbor. Uh, if you will be copying some of those uh, those show notes, um, that YouTube uh, video, if you probably many of you, if you're watching this, you've probably already seen that. So this is coming right on the heels of, of that conversation. And uh, my friend, and I know I pray he's a partner and friend with you too, wherever it is that you're seeking to get after mission and ministry, uh, Reverend Dr. Pat Ferry hanging out with me today. Uh, thank you, Pat, for your time. Here's the opening t- kind of tone of this conversation today. We want this conversation to be helpful and uh, not harmful. Uh, There are many details that are still unclear, and our aim is not to disparage President Eric Ankerberg, um, hoping to have him on the podcast as a guest in the future, or to disparage any of the staff or boards from either either university in their collaborative work. And so um, that is that is a tone in which we're starting and kind of the opening question Pat, and uh, to give us a little bit of, of your story, you know the pain of losing an alma mater, uh, St. John's in, in Winfield, Kansas in uh, 1986. That that university, that junior college uh, closed, the, the Johnnies. My dad was a Johnny. Yeah. He tells me funny stories about his time there at Concordia St. John. I know you have some, some stories as well, but what does that feel like, even as an alma mater, to know, wow, that place that shaped me it's no longer, it's no longer there. Yeah. Well, hey, yeah, let me get right to that in a second. But first, let me just also say thanks, Tim. Thanks for doing this. And thanks for your um, your introduction. I absolutely concur. Uh, President Ankerberg, I mean, I'm sad in his chair, probably literally the same one or some. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know that he is uh, uh, has a hard job and uh and he's working hard at it so this is this is really just about the bigger question the bigger issue uh not about people or personalities and uh and i'm grateful for his leadership and and uh and the boards as well the board is in a very challenging situation yeah and hopefully this this can bring just some perspective i've been reluctant as you know when you asked me to do this i've been reluctant to to um say much about it it's just uh, i i want to be uh mindful of uh, my place <laughs> as a predecessor, but I joined the much broader conversation that's going on in the, the, the church about this and, and uh, hopefully can bring something to it. And, you know, when you talk about St. John's College, it, it also just goes to show you that I'm an old guy now. It was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> that said, uh, even this morning, uh, on a text thread with some of my old classmates from St. John's College, staying in touch, close relationships. Uh, I'm married to a Johnny, so we talk about it now and then. Uh, mm-hmm. But it was, you know, it was a very special place in a very special spirit that um, uh, pervaded that campus and that experience, one that lives on, I think, in Johnny's today. And one, by the way, maybe as a segue, one that we, uh, that we kind of felt was very similar. It has been very similar uh, on the Ann Arbor campus. Tammy and I often commented on uh, just what an extraordinary, extraordinarily special place uh, that is, not unlike uh, St. John's was. Yeah, no, thank you. It's a, it's a precious place. Uh, lives, I mean, just listening to all the people that are talking about mm-hmm. what Concordia Ann Arbor has meant to them over the years. Uh, man, this just deep, deep love and care for well, and, you know, uh, the so, life so transformation. Going, too. 
yeah, such a sudden thing too. It's, you know, last week was Valentine's Day and, and uh, you know, uh, Concordia means hearts together, right? Hearts together, but the Valentine letter they got was, was a, a heartbreaking one really. And, uh, and any good English prof knows the value of euphemism when he says uh, to, you know, we're, we're going to reimagine our relationship uh, that, you know, that hits deep and, and it's hard. And it's, it was hard for him or for President Engelberg to say it. And it's hard for people to receive it. So there's a lot of discordia now, broken hearts uh, instead yeah. of hearts together. Yeah. So before we get into some of the financial current day financial um, conversation and partnership conversation, I think it's helpful to know the broader story of the merger between mm -hmm. Ann Arbor and Concordia University, Wisconsin, uh, that you documented. You shared that article with me in the room where it happened. <laughs> and uh, you stayed in this article that it wasn't entirely your doing. I think, Pat, some people know you as the, the president who saved Concordia Ann Arbor, but you are quick to note that it was all about cooperation and collaboration a whole bunch of folks coming together. Mm -hmm. And in 2008, the CUS uh, was in a growth mode. I, this is, I, I didn't know about this listener, maybe you do, but Concordia, Wisconsin was considering Confordia, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is like launching a second campus down there. Uh, but then you chose Concordia University, Ann Arbor, that partnership really over that potential vision down in Florida. It was a messy story of God at work. And I'm excited that you can share it now, Pat. Well, just a little bit about it. I, I think, you know, the situation is not the same today as it was, but it is probably helpful and instructive in many ways. We were in a very strong position there financially at that point in growth mode, looking for ways to expand Lutheran higher education um, mission and ministry. We'd had lots of interesting discussions along the way. Jack Preuss and I and our board chairs met to talk about maybe CUW and Concordia Irvine coming together in some extraordinary way. Uh, Confloria was a real option for us. We, we, we spent a lot of time in Florida working with people, thinking about how you know, we might start from scratch a uh, uh, Concordia campus. And Ann Arbor was in tough shape at that point. Uh, President Allersmeyer and I had had conversations. They were struggling. And we simply asked ourselves the question, what makes us think that we could be successful you know, in Florida and not successful in, in Michigan, the largest district in our synod, where, where the camp is a beautiful camp, an extraordinary location already in place, Lutheran faculty programs. Why, why do we think we could do one but not the other? And so we, we really felt quite confident that, uh, that if given the opportunity, we could, we could help turn things around in Ann Arbor. Uh, but that was a, with all due respect, I mean, this was a really, really long conversation, not one that lasted an hour uh, uh, like the recent board meeting where this was discussed for a little over an hour you know uh, this was this was weeks and months even years of considered reflection and due diligence and um, just I mean, kind of mind-bending questions and 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 we, we, we didn't do it even alone as a as a CUW community we we engaged uh, our CUS uh, involvement, uh, colleagues from from Chicago and from Seward, as well as Ann Arbor met CUS. It was a it was a a, a very uh, thorough collegial process, and and then even at the end when we finally made the decision, it was not an easy one to make, but it was it was very much I think mission driven and. Uh, and, and there was not one day uh, that I look back on it with any sort of regret, uh, still certainly true. And, even, and I would say, Tim, now more true than ever, uh, as we kind of assess the impact that uh, Concordia Ann Arbor has had and continues to have. And that merger took place what year? Was that when it was finalized? I think it was 2012. So it's been a little over a decade now. Yeah. Yeah. So it was 2000. I mean, the first conversations were years before that. Right. 2000, I think you said roughly eight, right? Yeah, I so, guess, as I recall, I wrote in a journal somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, four or five years of of conversation toward a yeah. collaborative end, and tell the early the early story. So you then were president for you know next six seven years, right? As the merger kind of solidified, yeah, I think a more is than that, that. Is that about, yeah, it's about eight or 
Eight or, eight or nine. Yeah. So Just what was, how did the relationship kind of evolve? Get us under the hood of how the relationship kind of, kind well, of strengthened. Our, our goal for us was, was to, to, uh, for me and for our leadership team was not to see us as two universities, but to see us as Concordia, yeah, one heart, one hearts together. That's what the magazine is called now. It's, it's shared one university, um, with, uh, uh with two, distinct, wonderful residential campuses, but a faculty, a single faculty. A, and, and, you know, it wasn't always easy. It's, it's, it's never been easy because, you, you know, you're, you just have some of those kind of local realities that are important histories and the like. But it, on the whole, I think people really embraced that and didn't see it as uh, us and them, except for when they played basketball. And, and, uh, <laughs> um, and that was more fun than anything else. But, but uh, it was... I think people really captured the idea that this was, we're in it together. Uh, we are, we, you know, uh, and, and that was important. It was important for our culture an important, um, important, um, dimension to, to why things worked the way they did. I think that, um, one thing I would say is we never viewed, uh, either campus as just an asset, uh, uh, you know, to, be considered for kind of transactional purposes. And I'm not implying that's exactly what's happening now, but that's certainly how it's being interpreted in some circles. Mm. So talk about the finances a little bit, both how did you make it work in those eight yeah. years? And then and then talk about the current crisis financially. Okay. Well, you know, it was certainly a lot different situation then than now. And, and I would argue far worse as far as Ann Harbor was concerned in those days. It had a lot of debt, uh, didn't have a lot of program uh, work that was being done, very much in need of, of uh, some uh, deferred maintenance. And, uh, and we were able, I think, with partners to, to tackle a lot of that up front. Uh, there was $20 million in debt that had to be figured out that uh, CUW absorbed half of it, but other partners, other uh, districts in the, the region, uh, LCEF, Michigan Church Extension Fund, folks sitting around the table, figuring out how we're going to tackle the debt before we start anything. And then, of course, the university has invested a lot of money in Ann Arbor. We've invested a lot of money into Mequon. I mean, that's what you do, right? You invest into your capital resources and your programs in order to, um, uh, to fulfill your mission. So, I mean, you don't keep track of that in a way as to something to kind of leverage against one campus or the other. You, you invest. You invest in your campus and capital resources, and other financial resources. And, um, and of course, we've, we've done that through the years. I think that, that uh, we had hoped that, that maybe in terms of operations that Ann Arbor would, would uh, turn very quickly. And, and that was based, I think, at that time on the the hope that adult education programs, non-traditional adult education programs could be uh, profitable and helpful on both campuses. That happened at, at just precisely the moment that those kind of programs went really downhill fast. I, I remember thinking about when I was first president, how in, in adult education, we competed with Cardinal Stritch University in Milwaukee, right? And then all of a sudden, we're competing with the whole world for adult education students. And so that, that part was not uh, as successful immediately as we'd hoped. But the enrollment trajectory at Concordia Ann Arbor has steadily been strong and, 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 and positive for traditional undergrad. And I'll say more about why that can't be the only thing you look at. Uh, but, but it has been uh, very strong. In fact, this year, they have the largest enrollment in the history of the school. The place is buzzing. You can't find a place to park. A lot of strong traditional undergraduate programs, but traditional undergraduate programs are very expensive. And, um, and that's true on any and every campus. Uh, we've seen a decline in traditional undergraduate uh, enrollment on the Mequon campus. It's hard. There are fewer students to draw from these days. And you can't expect to, uh, to be operationally in the black with merely a traditional undergraduate program. For that reason, the plan was to add uh, other programs in Ann Arbor. Uh, at Mequon, we had great success with healthcare programs, and those are very much in demand still today. 
And so investment was made to do that in Ann Arbor, to add physical therapy, nursing first, then physical therapy, occupational therapy, now more recently, physician's assistant program. Those programs are, are not inexpensive to start up, right? And in, in most cases, you have to have your full faculty in place before you can even have a student on campus. Mm -hmm. and, and, and only just now are they kind of rolling out uh, in their entirety in Ann Arbor. And um, I think if allowed to continue along this path because they are, they are fully subscribed, they would begin to show a significant return on investment. But even with those, Tim, uh, there, the, no, not very many schools like ours uh, are, are making it operationally in the black. Now, at Concordia, Wisconsin, we were able to do that for a long time, for many years, and it was a, a tremendous blessing. But the, the, the much more obvious uh, and necessary model these days is to draw upon, of course, annual fund donations that can be uh, uh, can be achieved and also to utilize endowment uh, endowments to to help yeah. to to benefit uh, uh, and defray operational expenses as well and i can tell you yeah. more about that if you want to talk about the finances well i think there's been some conversation around uh, needing and this is Michigan District. We'll put a link at the end of this. You know, mm -hmm. saying there's a five million that's needed from the wider church, and Michigan District's trying to get that. And um, uh, it's been said to just be a band aid, if if you will. Um, okay. And and yeah, I don't know well, the details of yeah. how long that would last. So yeah, get into a little bit more of the details sure. there with Ann Arbor, the and, five and million dollar deficit. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think what, what I'm hearing is that there's there's about a uh, nine million operational mm -hmm. deficit this year, uh, and of course that's that's a crummy year, right? I mean that's that's not good and and that's not sustainable. Um, but it's not the whole picture either, and I don't think by itself should in any way indicate a financial crisis uh, that would require some sort of uh, precipitous action. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me let me back up. And, I, and I'm not, I don't want to sound defensive in this regard at all. I mean, I've seen a few posts out there like, you know, gosh, there's been must there's been talk about mismanagement for, for years and years. I mean, what? Mm -hmm. it, well, here's here's kind of the reality. And this t may take a couple minutes. So if you don't mind, That's let me great. just I love and, it. And, and uh, you know, this is not my my particular area of forte. So I've been consulting to make sure I have my my information correct. Uh, people can utilize numbers and facts and figures to accomplish all kinds of different results, right? But this is this is kind of how I see it. So the merger is about ten years about ten years into the merger, right? Uh, but for nine of those ten years, CUWAA has been profitable on a consolidated basis for nine, including the last two years. Wow. profitable uh, on a consolidated basis. So those who say that Ann Arbor has been an anchor to Mequon, again, sort of dividing the, the discussion, it's just not true. Uh, and in fact, not only profitable nine of those last 10 years, but the average positive change in net assets, the average uh, profitability over, over the last decade has been $11.7 million a year. I mean, that's a positive wow. change in net assets of $11.7 million uh, average per year. And that has been typically just rolled over into the endowment. And this has allowed that endowment to, to grow. I and mean, when I first became president at CUW, we had a $25 million endowment. It's about $125 million now. Wow. And not big enough, but, but certainly making progress. 27 million of that uh, came over from Ann Arbor as part of the merger. So 27 million came. And of that 125 million, about $30 million is restricted. That means donors have given it and have said, you know, this has got to be used for scholarships or this has got to be used for this endowed chair. So about 30 million, but that means about $90 million of that endowment is unrestricted, board designated. Wow. The board can use it any way that it wants. And moreover, there is a board policy that allows the administration allows the administration to use 4% of the endowment each year for operations nice. uh, or for whatever it wants to, right? Build a new music bill. You can, you can use 4% of year, about 5 million a year you can use without any board action, right? It might be a good idea to report to the board that you've done that, but it doesn't require <laughs> its board policy, right? And the board could use, choose to do whatever it wants to with, with the $90 million. It could choose to do that. So, I mean, there's, there's, and, and again, and this is, 
someone put it to me this way recently, and this is this is I don't think my friend Bernard Bull would argue with this. But if if Concordia, Nebraska didn't rely on endowment earnings and annual fund giving to help defray operating deficits, that campus would be a, just a cornfield in Seward, Nebraska right now. Right. This is not this is not exceptional. This is typical. This is what endowments are for. And of course, the necessity of annual fund fundraising as well. Hmm. The Ann Arbor campus, if if it were sold off to a developer, right, the, the proceeds from that would simply by and large just be added to that endowment. Wouldn't have a campus there, but we'd have a larger we'd have a larger endowment. Now, this, this is another financial fact. There was, there was $11.3 million in cash uh, at the end of fiscal year, June 30, 2023. $11.3 million in cash at the end of last fiscal year in the bank. Mm-hmm. Um, Concordia has not drawn on its line of credit, which it is able to do, and Concordia's often have to do that as they consider the kind of ebb and flow of revenues at various times. So, uh, and I would add to that, this observation, that this year on June 30th, this coming June 30th, fiscal, the end of fiscal year 2024, just assuming that the stock market remains flat, okay, just remains flat, Concordia University of Wisconsin Ann Arbor will certainly end the year in the black uh, without having to sell <laughs> any anything. Uh, that, that doesn't mean that there aren't financial concerns, right? Mm-hmm. You, cannot, you cannot have those kind of operating deficits year in, year out. But to, 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 um, to suggest that this is a crisis that requires, again, this kind of extraordinary action, I mean, it would just be very difficult for me to look folks in the eye on June 30th and with this a positive change in net assets without utilizing any of the uh, endowment which we would be allowed to do uh, and and to say we had no choice right uh, and, that, so and again that may tough. not sound charitable I, I, I'm not intending I'm not pointing any fingers it's, this is a different interpretation of the same financial information that others have been uh, presenting uh, publicly. Yep. So Dr. Ankerberg has shared they're trying to find the right viable model mm-hmm. that protects Concordia, Wisconsin yeah. and Ann Arbor to grow. Do you yep. have any thoughts on what that model could be, Pat? Well, yeah, I, people have thoughts. I have thoughts. I think that one thing I would say, and this is with, with uh, complete respect and acknowledgement of uh, President Ankerberg's leadership, different leaders have different visions, right? Different leaders have different visions. And I think that that uh, that's fine. That's that's a good thing, right? It's, it was time for change, uh, for goodness mm-hmm. sake. And and if, if President Ankerberg's vision is to have a really strong, robust uh, Mech One campus, that that should be encouraged. That should be encouraged and, and, and supported. And I certainly would support him. But I don't think it has to happen at the expense of Concordia Ann Arbor. And, and, and I think, in fact, that, that there can be creative solutions to this that would allow the Ann Arbor campus to continue to, to grow and to flourish. Um, and, and what those might be, you know what? It took a long time to figure out how we got to where we were. Take a little time. You know, take a breath. Yeah. Hit the pause button. Work with the district. The district is motivated to be helpful uh, and and eager to find a way, working with other partners in CUS or or who knows what it might be. But but um, uh, but I know that once it's gone, it's gone. Right. And and, and that you can't turn you can't turn well, the page back on that. No, you, you can. And, and because of some of the communication that's come out mm-hmm. has been not as well received as I'm sure the team would have liked there. Uh, the the cat's out of the bag, if you will. And I mean, even in listening to some of those town halls, would executives send their kids to a school now right. that, that is already 
on the edge of being open next year or not? I mean, it's, no, that's a very, very fair it's question. Tough. I mean, you know, students been encouraged to consider transferring, and you know, if you're a recruit coming in, it's it's going to be very difficult, I think. But uh, unless, unless of course, unless. the 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 message Don't comes forward the, is to say, look, people have stepped up. We're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna take another look at this. Uh, I don't think it's a win lose proposition. I think it's a win win. I think Mequon can flourish, but if, if 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 that's not what the leadership and the board want to do, uh, if Ann Arbor if they don't want to do that, that's okay. Uh, but you know, Man. it doesn't have to be cl- closed out. Or and you know, it's just hard to imagine that as a synod. As, as a CUS system, that we're better off with, uh, you know, a new kind of high-end residential neighborhood along the banks of the Huron River than the Chapel of the Holy Trinity, uh, where we've had in the last several years scores and scores of of, of young students being baptized and brought into the church of of the gospel being proclaimed each day of of church workers and non-church workers being placed into to, to uh, uh, serving Christ in the church and in the world. I mean, it just, it's just, that's not, I don't suspect what, what is being reimagined, but that's what's at risk. Hmm. Well, these wounds are real. Uh, it's very raw. This is a big point of emphasis at, gosh, the last three conventions, Senate conventions I've been at, and there's a lot of Anger does not produce the righteousness of God, Pat. And anger actually leads us to yeah. the inability to think clearly. Uh, so any any um, thing I say or other say should be seasoned with salt, put the best construction on everything, um, try to work toward the the bond of peace and unity within the body of Christ. And I know that's what, what you tried to do for years and years. So what words of wisdom would you share with those who are angry and thinking, well, you know what, this is just par for the course. Uh, down goes another Concordia University uh, with the Synod living off of the asset. This is in line with some of Synod leadership wanting to get to, and I've heard this, the Hillsdale model of higher education, just consolidate all the Concordias into one institution, all in the hopes of protecting and purifying our doctrine in one location. To me, this sounds uh, like we've forgotten our missional model of our schools that should have baptisms like you just talk about, uh, kids coming to the faith. That you coming to the faith because of Concordia's Pat, and we're preferring more of a covenant model. Um, I mm. I would say some of those things, and I've heard others say even more loudly many of those many of those things. Uh, you can respond to that if you like, but that's yeah. that's where the hearts are of many people who are observing yeah. this this struggle right now, brother. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate the, the perspective. I you know I every situation has been a little different. Uh, St. John's College was different. I, uh, but I will say that in most every case, Selma, uh, Bronxville, um, Portland, Portland, but, but, but I, I can speak from experience with Selma and Bronxville. We spent a lot of time uh, as a CUS group and as presidents and as partners trying to, to find a way, trying to find a way. It wasn't, this wasn't the result of one kind of and this is this is again the the university had a consultant in gave a very negative report um this this is but beyond that this is sort of out of the blue for folks uh this was not a part of the strategic plan discussion um there are folks that i've talked to that that have some real questions about the uh, the um, consultation the report for one thing they didn't even have a conversation with with the most recent CFO who'd been there 23 years and presided over extraordinary growth. I mean, there are problems, they're problems. And I know that the board got this in the agenda and they talked about it for a little over an hour and then they acted. I mean, that with, again, with all due respect, their predecessor boards, many of them spent hours and hours and hours. You don't have the luxury of, of years. I realize that. But there's time to, to, to stop and ask, you know, is there something we can do? And I give a ton of credit to the Michigan District for, you know, kind of stepping into the breach. I know they're in the midst of a fun drive. Tammy and I made a pledge today uh, that we felt kind of stretched us. Uh, 
to to support the idea of looking for a different solution. And I hope others will too. Uh, I know it's going to take more than than a few people giving uh, some of their resources, but but it's it's the right kind of response that says we care about this and we we want to uh, we want to make a difference and we want to we don't want to lose a Concordia. And I don't know if, if others have a different idea of what what the system should be. That's fine, but I know historically, and, and Tim, I'm sorry, I'm glad. That so, was great. But you know what? Um, Concordia, Wisconsin, was established in 1881. I'm reading a I'm reading a biography of President Garfield. He was the president. <laughs> he just became president. It didn't last long before. But so, but Concordia, Wisconsin has has weathered. I mean, uh, kind of Jim Crow post Civil War era, the First World War, the, the Spanish flu, the, the Great Depression, the, the Second World War, the I mean, all of the things that have happened and it came very close to closing, by the way, at, at one point in its own history uh, until people came up with a more creative solution. And and you, you just can't tell me that. I mean, it's sort of be it's sort of hubris, wouldn't it, to say, "Yeah, but our times are so much more difficult than those times." They're not. They're not. We've got to we've got to have the sort of marathoner mentality of delayed gratification. You got to hang in there. You got to keep keep scrapping, keep scrapping. You don't have to settle for me- mediocrity. That's not what I'm suggesting. But I would argue that what's happening at Concordia Ann Arbor is far from mediocre. It's uh, it's having a big impact on a lot of a lot of people's lives. That historical perspective, Pat, is so helpful. We stand on the shoulders of those who have come. And this is what the kind of Western hyper-individualistic and all of us leaders are prone to just, we can kind of become anxious thinking we're so, and it's just not, there's nothing new. It's, it's obstacle, it's, it's chaos, it's disruption. It's, I thought this was going to work and now it's not. If I could pray for one thing in our church body, uh, it's just adaptive leadership and then just wisdom in team, cooperation, collaboration, care for one another, listening deeply for one another. That's what I'm praying for, for Dr. Ankerberg in the coming days for the board. Um, but, and, and just this deep respect, like I'm a, I'm, I don't have as much of a, if this were happening at Concordia Seward, yeah, I'd I'd probably would have teared up a time or two up to this point, thinking about the life transformation and your investment and so many that have and I know I know Dr. Ankerberg and the executive staff would say yes and amen to everything yeah, we just said. They they take the gravity of the situation very, very seriously. Um, it I, was I, I mean and, and I don't they may yeah. not appreciate me speaking into this. They didn't ask my opinion. Uh, and and I certainly don't want to offend anybody. I respect Eric and I respect the board. They have a challenging job before them. But I thank you for allowing me to uh, provide a little input. And um, <sighs> well, yeah, uh, you. I love I love your writing too. I thank you for documenting kind of the. Uh, the origin story of the the merger and in the room where it happened. We'll, we can link that uh, for folks too if they want to get deeper into that story. But you kind of close uh, saying that the LCMS rooms are far too small, and we're th- let's get above let's get above even this conversation right now uh, and move toward. I'm, I'm just finished a book called Metanoia. Pat by uh, Alan Hirsch and Rob Kelly, who are going to be guests on this show in the coming mm. months. But um, it, it's that meta, it's above, right? Mm. And knowing to set our mind above where Christ is, that's the 31 times metanoia is used uh, for, for repentance. And it's an ongoing thing. It's an individual thing, but it's way bigger than just guilt and and confession and individual absolution. There's this communal posture of of repentance and collectively and leadership teams setting our mind above where Christ is. And I really believe that if we set our minds above where Christ is, we move from scarcity to abundance. We move from fear to adventure, like just this open handed posture is what we live out of in the LCMS. And too often I see decisions made out of fear and and 
partisan politics, if you will, that are outside. This is the way of the world having an impact inside, which leads us to to make value statements about certain people because they associate with certain people. And it's just not healthy. It's not the Mm -hmm. way it's not the way of Jesus. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus came for the sick, not the well. Uh, Jesus crossed boundaries consistently. Pat, I'm I'm preaching the choir here, you know, but I just got to get this off my chest. Like Jesus Ah. went to the other people. Jesus had a huge room, Pat. Jesus Mm -hmm. cast vision to reach people with the gospel that went beyond the room, the Jewish room that went to Jew and Gentile, slave, free, young, old, rich, poor, male, female. And so can the rooms in the LC MS just become like Jesus large for us to listen to one another deeply. That's the aim of this podcast, man, is well, to have people on, was, you know, so, you on I got to compliment you on that because that's exactly what you're trying to do. You, you brought all kinds of folks in from different perspectives and uh, don't lose that passion. Don't lose that hope. Uh, things have been pretty quiet for me in my life since uh, last summer. And uh, uh, so this has been uh, fun. Uh mm-hmm. But I think it's really important. And and what you're doing is very important too, Tim. So keep up the good work. No, praise Jesus. So we're praying for everyone involved. We're praying that repentant posture individually and collectively <laughs> takes takes root. Uh, that unity and our common mission to make Jesus known wins the day. A couple action items for those of you who want to engage in this. Uh, go to the Mission District website to help uh, with a $5 million goal. There is a, a due date on that of February, I think, 28th, 29th, somewhere along there to hit uh, pledge support. Thank mm-hmm. you, Pat, for doing it. We're, my wife and I are going to be doing the same here. And if you're if you're talking about um, on social media, so, oh, Michigan District, I think, dot org. That's it. Michigan District dot org is yeah, where thanks. you can go to, to pledge support. There's one link there. It just says pledge support. It's right on the homepage. Super easy to find. And for those who are sharing thoughts, um, I, I listened or read Bernard Bowles. Really, <laughs> he wrote a real nice post, uh, an extended post on the inevitability of change in our systems uh, and and our unity around the, the cause of Christ. Uh, really, really thoughtful, helpful. Uh, but if you're praying for this, just put hashtag because of Concordia, because of Concordia as you're, as you're praying for everyone involved. Uh, and please share. Last note, this is a bonus episode of Lead Time. Please share. Uh, if this could help other people, uh, expand the rooms and get a little bit more in, uh, information, especially financially, uh, we're praying that Concordia uh, Ann Arbor would stay. Uh, this is what I'm praying. Concordia Ann Arbor would stay open, that creative solutions would be found, and that that unity and collaboration, if not with Concordia University, Wisconsin, that there's other players that could possibly, the Lord is the Lord of the harvest, right? He owns it all. Mm-hmm. That other partners would even come forward for creative, cre- creative problem solving. This is a good day, even in the midst of struggle and trial, which is inevitable. We have Jesus. He is King and Lord over all things. And Pat, thank you for staying engaged in the conversation and uh, coming off the side. I know you're just you're just doing your thing. You're reading. You're writing. The last question before I let you go: What is occupying your your days? I, I love your history books. I just watched a documentary yesterday about Theodore Roosevelt, uh-huh. Pat. His his biography. You talk about a renaissance man who did everything turn of the century. But yeah, what are you what are you reading? What's engaging you right now, Pat? Just personally. Well, you know, I've, I've been uh, I've been doing a lot of reading, and uh, I always I enjoy biography. I, I'm reading a fair bit of uh, actually sort of ancient philosophy along the way. I'm reading the the, uh, the Stoics, um, mm. and uh, there's some some interesting lessons to be learned from them, uh, including not taking this personally, <laughs> and and ultimately <laughs> not worrying too much what people think about you. So, you know, uh, those are probably a few lessons. And that said, again, I, I certainly have not ho- hoped to contribute to any negativity, but hopefully just to round out the, the question here. And I'm, and by the way, I'm open to being helpful if I can be. And if not, then thanks at least to you, Tim, for this opportunity. What? Oh, it's, yeah, it's an honor. What is your e- email, if you don't mind sharing it, if folks want to connect with you? Okay. Uh, it's Patrick T. Ferry at gmail.com. Patrick T. Ferry at gmail.com. It's a good day. Go and make it a great day. This is Lead Time bonus episode, and we'll be back a couple episodes every single week being released right now, hopefully for helpful Jesus-centered conversations uh, around health in the local church. Jesus loves you so much. Uh, Go and share his love with others. Peace. Thanks so much, Pat. Thanks, Tim. 
You've been listening to Lead Time, a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective. The ULC's mission is to collaborate with the local church to discover, develop, and deploy leaders through biblical Lutheran doctrine and innovative methods. To partner with us in this gospel message, subscribe to our channel, then go to the uniteleadership.org to create your free login for exclusive material and resources, and then to explore ways in which you can sponsor an episode. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for next week's episode.